Hi, I'm Andrew Pierce with Epix at Purdue. In this module, we're going to talk about the basics of the design process in Epix. This is a very high-level overview of the design process and some of the characteristics of that process. And if you want to get into more detail on any of these stages, check out our YouTube channel for additional modules that go into more detail on each stage of the process. In this module, you're going to learn how to understand some of the principles of design. So what are some of the background philosophy behind what we do? You'll be able to describe each of the phases of the EPICS design process. You'll get to know some useful tools for each of those stages. And then finally, you'll learn a little bit about good and bad practices in design. Okay, so the first part of the module is gonna to be to talk about some of the principles of design. So this is some of the background idea behind the work that we do in the design process and the actual stages. So the first thing I want to talk about is a little bit about student development and moving from a novice designer to an expert designer. So there are two sort of dimensions of expertise that you'll develop as a student designer. And the first one is technical capability. So being able to do the design process well, being able to work in really complex uh, environments and being able to work in a situation where you have some ambiguity where the the right answer isn't necessarily there in front of you or maybe there isn't necessarily a correct answer but you have to work in, in a system that has a lot of unknowns and you have to figure out how to work through those unknowns that is most of what your education especially if you're in a technical field is going to be about so they're driving you toward expertise in those technical areas whatever your discipline may be but the second dimension of that is working with people now, whether they're your stakeholders of your project, your team members, if it's in a leadership or a follower role, learning how to work in those things are another dimension of expertise. And in most of your traditional education, you're driven along the technical path, and then you're just thrown into the people part and expected to kind of figure it out. Well, in Epics, we take a little bit different track. We're trying to move you along both of those dimensions at the same time so that you can develop yourself as a designer in both dimensions at once and really develop the expertise in a way that makes sense. So you can kind of take a stepwise approach. And that's why taking a design project along multiple semesters of your educational career can be really helpful in building that expertise. So if you hear us talk in epics more than your other classes about developing empathy and working with people, this is the reason why we're trying to move you along both of those dimensions together. So in light of that, the first principle we'll talk about in our design process is human-centered design, really keeping people first in the process. Then we'll talk about universal design and what that means in the context of your work. We'll talk about iteration and a minimum viable product. And then the last one will be an empirical or data-driven basis to your decision-making. And if you can keep those four sort of principles in mind behind all of the stages of design, you'll be successful. So the first one of these principles is user-centered design. And this is the idea that you really focus on the stakeholders in every stage of the design process. So from the very beginning of design, you're gonna think about what does my user need? And then as you go through each of the processes or each stages of the process, you'll think about that user, talk with the user, get their input and their feedback and everything you do. A big part of this process is to gain empathy for your users. And what that means is not that you just rationally understand what they want, but that you can emotionally put yourself in their shoes. So we talk a lot throughout um, our process about being able to walk in their shoes or being able to design for someone else like you are designing for yourself. We're all experts in designing for ourselves, but we want to go out and design for someone else. You have to learn to put yourself in their point of view. Um, the third big piece of user-centered design is doing co-design. So we design with our users, our community partners, our end users. Those are all people who are stakeholders in the project and we want them to have an active role in design. We're not just designing for them, we're designing with them. So treat your users, your stakeholders as experts in the design process, not as a faceless end customer and definitely not as a victim. We definitely want to avoid you getting into the superhero mentality where there's some unfortunate person with a disability or who lives in a low income neighborhood or who has some need where you need to come in, uh, you know, riding in on your horse and save them, save the day. That is not how we want to treat our users. That's a great way to offend a user and lose their participation in the design process. So please keep in mind, they are experts and useful in the process. You're there to help them and work with them, not to save them. 
So please be careful in the way that you approach your users and try and build empathy with them and work with them through every stage of the process. The second principle is universal design. And this is the simple idea that your design should not be more exclusive than is required. So anything you design, you should try and have as many people as possible be able to use it without any hindrance or having to have special um, considerations to use it. So a great example would be uh, curb cuts on the sidewalk. So that's those little sloped areas that go down to the road from the sidewalk. Those were implemented for people in wheelchairs. But really, they're a great example of something that works well for everybody. If you're on a bicycle, a skateboard, if you're pushing a stroller, just walking up them if you have any kind of motor disabilities is a lot easier than walking up an uncut curb. So that's a, a, an example of where you can take something um, and design it to be useful for everyone, not just for a specific disability. So think through those things. Um, if you're interested in universal design, there are a lot of resources out there to learn about the principles of those types of design. The third principle that we're going to work with is iteration. And we'll talk about iteration both in your concepts and iteration through the whole process of design. So if you're trying to mastermind a design, and by mastermind, I mean come up with a perfect plan and execute it perfectly, you are going to fail. Because you're working in an area where you don't have expertise, or you're really at the edge of technology and being innovative where you don't know how to do what you're trying to do, you have to work through it, um, you're going to fail. So the best way to fail is to fail quickly and fail cheaply. Go out, try something very quickly, see what happens, learn from it, do that again, and after a couple of iterations of doing that, you'll have enough experience and enough knowledge to be able to design something that's successful and that you can go ahead. So as you prototype, do really rough, quick, low fidelity prototypes quickly, learn from them, and then come back and try again. A good example of this was the organization IDEO was working on an apparatus with a medical device company to work on delicate nasal tissues. And as their very good designers set to work on this process, they didn't know what they were doing, and the prototype they generated looked something like this. And from that very simple prototype, just a little bit of tape, something you could put together in a few minutes, they were able to talk with their users about how they would use it, what kind of ergonomics they should have, how the process would go, and they ended up developing something like this that was very successful on the market. So start with those really low fidelity prototypes and start learning what doesn't work very quickly. So the next thing on iteration is the idea of a minimum viable product. So a minimum viable product is the least thing that could do the job that would work in the market. So that's the minimum viable product you could make. So if I asked you, for instance, to develop a robot that would allow you to participate remotely in a meeting or a conference, a lot of you, especially the more ambitious of you, would think of something like the image here. So you have a robot that would allow you to walk around the room, interact with people, pick things up and show it to them. You can see them and they can see you. There is a lot of things going on there in your feature set. And that's a really cool idea. And you might set out to try and build that and work on it for three or four years and fail miserably because it's too complex. So I'd say maybe instead think about something like this, okay? So this has some of the features you wanted. You can see people and they can see you and you can move about the room and interact as though you were there. But maybe there's something even simpler than that, like maybe just a FaceTime call that would allow you to participate in the meeting as though you were there. Now, of course, you'd have to ask people to move you around and you can't pick up and move things in the room, but this is a viable solution to the problem. And you could have this implemented in a day. So think about, if you were asked to do this problem and you came to your user and you started with the far right image and you never got there, you've provided them no value. But if you start with the far left image with the FaceTime call, you could provide immediate value, which gives you time to work on a more complicated solution like the one in the middle. And then once you have that one implemented, you've solved most of their problems again, and that gives you more time to work on an even more complex solution like the one on the right. So if that's your ultimate end goal, you can be a lot more successful and provide a lot more value by starting simply and iterating toward the more complex solution. So that's the idea of minimum viable product and really keep that in mind through all of the projects, especially if you're starting something brand new. And the last sort of principle we'll talk about is making data-driven decisions. So we really want to avoid you just working off the cuff or making decisions without any rational basis. You want to stop and think about what is the good evidence behind the decision you're making? 
why should someone else believe you that that's a good decision? And that's usually by providing some evidence or data to support your decision, showing that you can understand the trade-offs in design. If I give you something that is more complex, it's going to be more expensive. And how much more expensive? What's it going to cost? Being able to provide people data helps them to make good decisions, and it helps you as a designer to make good decisions. But on the flip side of this, as you start to become data-driven, you can get stuck in more and more and more analysis. Where does it stop? So you really want to avoid that analysis paralysis or getting stuck in something where you're doing so much analysis you never get into action. So we want you to make data-driven decisions, but we also want you to make them quickly. So don't feel like you need perfect data have data that supports your decisions, and move forward. So remember, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Your solution may be totally off if you don't have data. But at the same time, we want to work quickly. We want to be efficient and agile through the work that we do. So always keep those balances in mind as you work through your project. So in summary on this section, uh, make sure that you are designing with and for real people. We're providing you in Epics with real projects, with real customers talk to them, make use of them, and work with them as a team. Make your designs as inclusive as possible. We want everyone to be able to use the products that you design. If you choose to commercialize your products at the end of the day, this will be helpful to you. Start with that minimum viable product and iterate to add features. Don't start with a really complex big scope project. Defend the scope of your project and keep it small. And finally, make choices based on solid evidence. So during your design reviews, your reviewers will want to see that you've made sound choices. Your project partners will want to know that you've made sound choices. So provide evidence to support those things.